Welcome to Michael Myers Minute, where we delve into the 1978 horror classic Halloween one minute at a time. I'm your host, Robert Black. Wednesday night was Halloween. I hope you had a great time. I had a wonderful time, I'm sure. If you heard nothing just then, it means one of two things. One, I forgot to record an insert about what I did Halloween night, or two, I didn't do anything exciting. Or three, Michael Myers found me two nights ago and I am dead, and you were lucky that I schedule episodes ahead of time. No, I'm here. I just delayed the insert. So I gotta give a shout out to Sarah Rose at Shookmint Gallery because that's where I ended up for Halloween, and she let me in for free because I've been there a few times. It was fun. I watched the first two Halloween films, <laughs> which are still, you know, canon for me. Let's see, some highlights. Uh, there was a police officer that drove by playing the Halloween theme over his loudspeaker, and then he stopped, came in for photos, and at one point even asked if they had the broom, which they have a, like a witch's broom, looks like it flies and stuff. I didn't see the photos he took, but I assume he posed with the broom. During the 78 original, there was an odd bit of laughter at different parts, especially in the last act, certain things that would happen, people would laugh. And it wasn't like they were laughing because they were nervous, like they were actually amused. And I was wondering if these people had seen the movie so many times that they're amused at a different level, or if these were people seeing it for the first time, like just experiencing it very differently than we would have years ago. During Halloween 2, there was a little girl there with her mother and grandmother, and it was funny when the nurse... <laughs> Shows her breasts, the little girl like immediately hid behind her blanket. She didn't want to see that, but when Michael was chasing Lori through the hospital and through the basement, she uh, was like sitting up, wrapped at attention, which was great. My costume was essentially death. From the front, it was a all black, had a cape, had a hood, and the hood covered the top half of my face because I wear glasses and I didn't get contacts just for a costume so just kind of hide that with the hood in a bright area i can still see through it so it's fine and anywhere else i just gotta look down and then the lower half of the face was covered by a cloth black wrap around with a skull on it or half a skull and if you stand still enough with that or sit still enough you could be <laughs> mistaken for a statue or it was funny at one point i was sitting and someone walked by and i hear a guy say oh i thought that was a person like he was looking at me and I wasn't moving. So he decided that what he thought was a person wasn't. And then I moved and like looked at him. <laughs> He's like, oh, it is a person. <laughs> He's like, oh, creepy. And he like kept walking. So that was cool. But it was nice because in that costume I have the had the inclination to keep quiet. Like I said before, way back when I first went to Sugar Mint and later I interviewed Lito Velasco. Shape of Fear cosplay. I don't really have much interest in cosplaying as Michael. Like getting in that mask that covers the whole face and having to be quiet. I could do a pretty good cosplay of Dr. Loomis, I think. I'm still younger than he was in the original, but I got the facial hair going. Just gotta shave the sides. Wear a bald cap or shave the top of my head. No, I don't want to shave the top of my head. You know, get a little crazy. Shot him six times. Shot him in the heart. And all that. Get into the the darkness of him. Just trying to understand what we're dealing with here. Don't underestimate it. After last night being like death and walking around, especially at night, it's like people walk by and all they're seeing is this little bottom half of a skull and darkness. It's kind of nice. Kind of freeing. It's like I'm walking into a dark alley to take a picture after the movie where Loomis said that line, you know, I shot him six times, I shot him in the heart. I saw that scene be filmed when I was five. I'm walking in that alley and I'm like, it doesn't even matter who's in there. I'm the scary one right now. Anyway, back to minute 48. We continue where we left off, obviously. Mid-word. The pathway to the Wallace's laundry shed. Minute 48. Annie is locked inside that shed. Lindsay is watching TV. Michael's watching Annie and someone is doing something in the dark side of the Wallace living room. And we get to hear John Carpenter's voice. Annie, mid-word. Andre room, or Andre room is how it's in, I think. And the door won't open. Interior, Wallace house. Lindsay Wallace. 
eight years old with a pretty face, watches the horror marathon at top volume on TV. She doesn't hear Annie's call. That's what the script says. Clearly she does hear Annie. She just doesn't react. We've talked already about Kyle Richards, who plays Lindsay, back in minute two. As for Lindsay, we'll sort of see the character in a cameo on Halloween 4, and she plays a part in Chaos Comics Halloween. She has grown up to be a reporter. She is watching The Thing from Another World, the same movie Tommy and Lori were watching over in the Doyle house in Minute 45. This is Minute 19 of that film. Minute 19, second 13 of that film, Captain Hendry is saying, Spread out, everybody, we're going to try to figure out the shape of this thing. Ha ha, clever, put in the line about the shape. And the movie on TV cuts forward nearly 20 seconds. There seems to be a couple shorter jumps as well between the lines of dialogue that follow. Multiple voices from the TV say, Holy cat, hey, it's almost, yeah, almost a perfect. It is. If you don't know the movie, they're standing on the ice, and there's something under the ice, and they're gathering around the shadow, and they realize it's a circle, because they found a flying saucer. Second 12. The camera has panned around from the TV to angle on Lindsay. At the left side of the screen, something is going on. Something moves on the end of the couch opposite Lindsay and then jumps, is pulled over the back of the couch. By second 14, as the guy on the TV says, it's round. If it's an animal, it doesn't seem to have legs. If it's a piece of cloth, it seems to be pulled by no one. There are two different IMDb goofs for this one. In a close-up on the phone before Lindsay answers it, someone's shadow moves into the light. That one's just vague. The other one. At around 47 minutes, while Lindsay is watching Forbidden Planet and is alone in the living room, the camera dollies across the couch. A large shadow moves across the couch from out of the shot, but no one should be in the room with her. But whoever wrote it, this one, didn't even know what movie Lindsay was watching and the shadow is not that big. Plus, I noticed this one before I copied and pasted the IMDb goofs into my notes. My theory. It is someone in the cast or crew trying to distract Kyle Richards because she is so good at looking wrapped and or bored. Or more of the ballet that this production involved working with a small crew in practical spaces. I learned at the H40 convention, actually I'd heard about this before but heard a little more detail, that during the opening tracking shot, for example, crew members climbed into the Myers house through the living room window as Michael walks back to the kitchen door to enter so that they could be readying the space ahead. They had a parade of people involved in that shot. Tommy Lee Wallace listed them off. Ray Stella, camera operator. Or Dean Cundy himself, depending on the take. They'd switch off. Deborah Hill, in clown costume for the hand shots. A lighting person. Tommy himself carrying a bucket and paintbrush to splatter Sandy Johnson with fake blood when she got stabbed. And PJ Souls interjected because Tommy forgot that the boom operator, Joseph Brennan, who we saw reflected in the phone booth back in minute 20, would have been there too. And I assume John Carpenter was somewhere close by as well, but Tommy didn't mention him. Tommy said the filming of the opening sequence opened my eyes to what fun you can have with a shot. A wonder. So I imagine this shadow comes from a lighting guy, maybe. Or Joe Brennan again. Realized too late that his shadow was in the shot and moved to the side. Or it's the shadow of Lindsay Wallace's alien leader come to tell her to try to behave more like a human child. The phone rings. From the TV we hear, we finally got one. We found a flying saucer. Interior. Laundry room. In the script. Annie says, Lindsay, I'm in the laundry room. Door is stuck. Annie turns and glances at the window above the washing machine. The shape is gone. She quickly crosses to the washing machine, climbs up on top of it. It's a bunch of stuff that happens out of order here. Uh, and then Annie, still the script. Lindsay, Lindsay, goddammit, help. This doesn't happen. Second 17, Annie is at the door to the shed. We watch from outside the shed. Through the back window, Michael is visible. And I love this shot because we're outside, so we're looking through one window at Annie. But through the next window is Michael. It's a nice, like, double block of the two panes of glass, plus we're behind the camera, so we're watching up on the big screen or on our TV or wherever. It's a great combo. From the house, Annie hears the phone ring. Annie, oh, Lindsay, get the phone. It's Paul. Lindsay, Lindsay. Second 28, inside the shed now. Annie turns and glances at the window by the shelves, not above the washing machine. The shape is gone. So this is the part that was in the script a second ago. She quickly crosses and starts out the window. Annie, oh, Paul, don't hang up. Interior, Wallace House, second 45. Lindsay still sits in front of the TV. She lets the phone ring away. 
Finally, in the script, it says she gets up and walks to the phone. Her eyes pivoted on the TV and picks up the receiver. Of course, in the movie, she doesn't have to go anywhere. She just picks up the receiver, doesn't have to take her attention off the TV. Lindsay, hello. And Paul, voiced, of course, by John Carpenter, says, hi, Lindsay, this is Paul. Is Annie there? Lindsay, yes, she is. Paul, get her for me, will you? Lindsay, proving she has been paying attention. She's washing her clothes. Paul, look, just tell her it's me, okay? Lindsay takes a breath, perhaps exhausted by the thought of getting off the couch, or, and I can so relate to this one, exasperated by the idea that she's going to have to miss part of the movie she's watching just because Annie spilled something again. And you know Annie spills things all the time. Did you see how casually she just flung that butter at herself in minute 43? Watching a movie today, you've got Netflix, Hulu, Shudder, HBO, what have you. DVD player, a DVR. You've got options. They all come with a pause button. In 1978, little Lindsay Wallace is watching The Thing from Another World for the first time, and it's on commercial television, and maybe her parents don't let her watch such movies. So she loves it when Annie, or Lori, or maybe even Linda babysit it. She can just sit back, let them have their make-out sessions or casual sex. As long as they stay out of her bedroom, she doesn't care, while she watches scary movies in the dark. Remember the exchange later, which is a weird phrase. Annie, I thought we understood each other. Lindsay, I want to stay here and watch this. And now Annie has the gall to make her get up and it's not even a commercial break? Hell no. I go to a movie in the theater and I'm sipping my soda slowly so I can hold off going to the restroom until afterward. Because I don't want to miss a moment. Lindsay doesn't even know how long it might take to help Annie right now. What if she has to call for help? What if she never gets back to the movie? And the Wallaces don't even have a VCR yet, so it's just this one time, and she's seen 20 minutes already. She's committed. They just found a flying saucer. She doesn't want to leave right now. Anyway, Lindsay takes a breath, and the minute ends. We won't know what Lindsay does until next time. We won't know what they do about that flying saucer until, well, until you go watch the thing from another world. It's okay. (laughs) <laughs> we talked about it in minute 45. Carpenter's remake is a much better film, but the original is good. It's interesting. And Lindsay wants to know how interesting it is. And she deserves to. But Annie has to go and interrupt, because that's what Annie does. That is all from minute 48. Michael Myers Minute is a production of Lemming Drops Studio. You can find more content at lemmingdrops.com. You can stalk me on Twitter and Facebook at Myers Minute or Instagram, Michael Myers Minute. Or join our Facebook listeners group, 45 Lampkin Lane. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a nice review if you like what you hear. And if you really like what you hear, you can help me out by donating through Patreon at patreon.com slash Minute and join the Thorn Cult. And it's the first of the month, so I should mention we have our first member of the Thorn Cult, Heidi Bennett of Cabot Minute Cast and Vibrant Visionaries Podcast. This is our first backer on Patreon. Until next time. See you later. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh?